Hey guys, so for my first video, I'm going over the case of Winnie Ruth Judd, also known as the Trunk Murderess. This is an older case going back to like the 1930s, so it is a little different, but I hope you enjoy, and if you have any comments or thoughts of your own, please go ahead and share. So Winnie Ruth Judd was born in 1905 in Darlington, Indiana. At the age of 19 years old, she married a man named Dr. William C. Judd, a World War I vet. He was 22 years older than her, so he was about 41. The couple moved frequently looking for work due to Dr. Judd being addicted to the meds he was given from his injuries from World War I. Um, so they eventually settled in Los Angeles, California, where Dr. Judd opened a practice. Oh, hello, Nixon. <laughs> Um, by 1930, Winnie, going by her middle name Ruth, left LA and her husband for good. She moved to Phoenix, Arizona, where she worked for um, a governess to a wealthy family, so she was basically teaching homeschooled kids at home. Um, during the time, she met John Jay, which also nicknamed Happy Jack, Hollerin. Um, he was a 44-year-old businessman. <laughs> he just wants to be in the camera, apparently. Um, although he was married, he was also known as a playboy during his time. The two became very close and eventually had an affair. A few, min a few months later, Ruth started working at a place called Grunau Medical Clinic, which is also located in Phoenix. She ended up meeting um, two ladies there, one named Agnes Leroy, um, and then her roommate Hedvig Samuelson. The two moved from Alaska um, after Samuelson con contracted tuberculosis and Judd became so close with the two girls she even moved in with them for a couple months in 1931. So all three of the girls were very friendly with Hollerand. So a few months later there was a few differences between the women. So Judd eventually moved closer to her job at Grunau, however the girls still frequently had um, girls night, so it wasn't unusual for Judd to be over. However, on the night of October 16th, 1931, Ruth went to the girls' apartment for dinner and drinks. However, it would be the last. A fight broke out and we're unsure as to why or what they were fighting about, possibly an affair between the women and Hollerin maybe, really not sure. However, um, a gun was pulled and all three women were shot. Winnie was shot in her left hand, and the two girls were fatally shot while they were asleep in bed. The two victims were killed with a 25 caliber handgun in their rented bungalow after they were murdered. Judd, we're unsure completely if there was an accomplice or if it was just her, it's really unclear, but she dismembered the body of Samuelson. And let me just say the cuts were very clean, so it's a little odd. Um, she stuffed the head, torso, and lower legs in a black shipping trunk with an, wow, <laughs> with the upper legs being placed in a beige hat box. Okay, can you like sit down please? And Leroy's body was actually stuffed intact in a second black shipping trunk. So just two days after the murders took place, it was Sunday, October 18th, Judd took all the shipping containers containing the bodies, which she actually stuffed clothes, newspapers, and bullets on top of the corpse. She got on a train and headed to LA. And um, let me just say, her brother actually lived in LA, so she was going to meet her brother there. All while, she actually wrapped up her hand because she did have a gunshot wound. As she made her way to LA, she was just about to get off the train at around 7.45 the next morning, so October 19th. The people working on the train were really suspicious of these trunks due to a really foul odor and there was actually fluids leaking from them. So a man by the name of Arthur Anderson, who was um, a badge agent on the train, asked Judd to open the trunks. However, she stated she didn't have a key with her, so she was unable to open them. So there's a little bit of time gap. So going back to Winnie's brother, his name was Burton McCannell and he was a junior at the University of Southern California. And 
as he was going to pick up Winnie, he actually had no idea what was going on, didn't know anything about the trunks. He just picked up Winnie and then dropped her off somewhere in Los Angeles. So before I start talking about the trial, I actually want to go back and talk about the crime scene. So when the police showed up to the bungalows in Phoenix on Monday, October 19th, um, the police walked into the crime scene. They actually allowed neighbors and reporters in as well, which is completely tampering the crime scene. Um, the following day, the landlord of the bungalow actually placed an ad in the newspaper informing residents that if they want to come and take a tour of this crime scene, it would only be 10 cents per person. So within the next few weeks, the entire crime scene was basically gone and just like tampered with, like there was nothing they could do about it. So the cops were able to actually find one of the mattresses and it was in a vacant lot miles away from the crime scene. However, it had no blood on it and they were never able to find the second one. Now onto the trial. It took about three months after the bodies were found for the trial to begin and it took place in Phoenix, Arizona. And the state argued that Judd acted with premeditation and that the motive was jealousy due to Samuelson and Leroy having a relationship with Holleran. However, Judd did try and say that it was a self-defense move and that the gunshot was self-inflicted to make the story seem real, but the whole dismembering of Samuelson didn't make sense. Um, it was said that one at one point though that Judd was not sane. So finally on February 8th, 1932, the jury, um, the jury found Judd guilty of first degree murder. She was sentenced to be hanged February 17th, 1933 and was sentenced to the Arizona State Prison in Florence. After having a 10 day hearing of her mental incompetence, the death sentence was actually repealed. So she was then sent to Arizona State Asylum due to being insane on April 24th, 1933. So throughout the trial, Jack Holland was actually a suspect and he was indicted by the grand jury as an accomplice to murder on December 30th, 1932. Following the testimony from Judd, she said, I am going to be hanged for something Jack Holleran is responsible for, and I was convicted of murder, but I was shot in self-defense. Jack Holleran removed every bit of evidence. He is responsible for me going through all of this, and he is guilty of anything I am guilty of. Judd claimed that she was going to the apartment to play bridge and that a fourth woman was actually there, but had already left. She was she said there was an argument about Judd's introduction of Holleran to another woman and that she killed Leroy and Samuelson in self-defense after they physically attacked her, according to Judd after the killings. Holleran returned with her to the bungalow and after seeing the bodies went out to the garage to grab the trunk and told her not to tell anyone. However, two days after the murders, Judd admitted to repacking Samuelson's dismembered body in the trunk. When it came to Holleran, he told the court that Judd is just making up a story and that she is an insane person. And since Judd testified saying that the killing was in self-defense, Holleran had no crime to commit and therefore, on January 25th, 1933, he was freed. When Judd was committed to a mental asylum, she escaped six times. However, the last time she escaped, she made her way all the way to San Francisco Bay, where she lived as a live-in maid for a wealthy family, and she changed her name to Marion Lane. She was there for about six and a half years when she was finally discovered and taken back to Arizona August 18th, 1969. And finally, in 1983, the state of Arizona issued her an absolute discharge so she was no longer a parolee. She finally died at the age of 93 on October 23rd, 1998. So a discovery in 2014 brought up the case again when a confession letter was found and it was written in April 1933 with Judd's handwriting and it was addressed to her attorney Richardson. In the letter, it said, first and only confession. She stated that she planned and carried out the murder of Leroy alone and that she had not planned to kill Samuelson, but ended up doing it because Samuelson was alerted by the gunshot that killed Leroy. 
She began fighting with Judd, and this is when Samuelson got shot, and she stated again that she acted alone in handling and transporting the bodies. The reason the confession letter came out was because Richardson was hiding it, and when he died, Judd wrote to his widow asking for the letter back a few years later, which was had to something to do with um, her mental illness and stuff. So a few years after Judd's death, the letter was anonymously donated to the Arizona State Archives. So what are your thoughts? Do you think Judd acted alone or do you think she had help? It's a pretty interesting case, but in my belief, I think she had help. There's no way a small woman was able to handle these bodies and dismember one all by herself. It seems a little fishy. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you want to hear more videos like this, go ahead and subscribe. I'm going to be uploading a new one every week, so stay tuned.